Thank you, Principal, very much for that introduction and for pronouncing Chevalier correctly. His portrait is here. Many people think it's uh, Chevalier because of the famous um, French um, song, right, song person, but it's, it's Chevalier. Thank you. So, what I'm going to do is I am going to talk about the James Webb. It'll be a golden thread running through my talk, but I will apparently digress every now and again to give some context because the James Webb telescope is just a telescope. And there are many telescopes in space. There are many telescopes on the ground also. So I will be giving some context, but nevertheless, the James Webb will be the theme of the talk. Oops, I'm hoping that, yes. So just for the initial context, you can see the portrait right here. Well, actually, he's, he's rather in shadow. But if you could see him in the light, this is him, Tempo Chevalier, with the white beard. I don't look much like him, but I've still got time to grow the beard, maybe in the future. This is the observatory that was founded shortly after the university, not far from here on Potter's Bank. It's a really nice old building, and we're hoping to use it for um, outreach purposes in the future, providing we can get the donors. That's not a hint, but uh, it would be nice. <laughs> so I'm not a rocket scientist. I'm an observational astronomer, as Wendy has already said. But I have interests in um, space and also in outreach. So a very general question, first of all, before we get on to James Webb. Why do we go into space? It's a very risky business. As some of you will know, two out of uh, what number 30, 135 shuttles blew up with the loss of everybody on board. Who would get on an aeroplane with a one in 70 chance of it crashing? Nobody. So risky business. Now, fortunately, the telescopes don't have humans associated with them when they're launched. So if we lose a payload, it's very sad. People have worked on the project for many years. It's terrible for them, but people don't die. Still, it's risky. So one of the reasons uh, people want to go to space is because it's fun. And maybe in 50 years, 100 years, who knows, it may be the same sort of thing these days that people go on to cruise ships. Maybe people will be going to space stations and having a week to look down on the Earth but they better be fairly rich. Probably not billionaires, but maybe millionaires at least. But that is in the future. Space could be the next battlefield, which is sad, but nevertheless true. There are many satellites up there now which are spying on us. And uh, some of you may not know that in addition to the International Space Station, which we all know about, there is a Chinese space station with three Chinese astronauts up there now, going round and round and looking down on us. Um, so that's going to increase in the future. Why do we do astronomy at all? Well, that's a very big question, and I don't want to go into a, a long sidetrack onto the reasons, but let's just say people are interested in our, in our place in the universe. And I will come onto this later, in particular, are we alone in the universe? Are there other planets like Earth, other life forms? And perhaps more um, prosaically, how did the universe begin and how will it end? Rather more intellectually than are the aliens out there and will they come and visit us? So here we go. The James Webb Space Telescope was launched on Christmas Day 2021. I remember it very, very well because I was asked to write a short piece for the Guardian newspaper and they wanted it before the launch. So I wrote two versions. One was for a successful launch and one was for a disastrously bad launch because I knew I wouldn't be able to write it if that happened. And a bit like um, Eisenhower on D-Day, I tore up the failed uh, bit and I gave them the one where it was successful. And indeed it was. So acronyms, we all deal in acronyms. You know what NASA stands for, everybody knows that. Many people will know what ESA stands for, 
the European Space Agency. Fewer people will know what CSA stands for, and that is the Canadian Space Agency. So it's roughly 80% of the James Webb is NASA, roughly 15% uh, is ESA, and the remaining five or slightly more is um, the Canadian Space Agency. Now, I just get out my uh, laser pointer here. The one on the slide changer is too feeble, so I'm using my weapons grade Chinese laser pointer to, uh, to show you where things are. You can see here the payload, of course, it's an artist's impression, it isn't the real thing, of how the James Webb was squeezed into this very um, compact region in the cone of the rocket. It had to then deploy, and as you can see here, this is a full-size model of the James Webb telescope, not the original, because um, NASA didn't want it to get uh, rained on in the parking lot, but it nevertheless a full-size model. So clearly, that wasn't going to fit in here. So it had to be folded up a bit like a flower and then unfold. So I'm one of about 2,000 scientists and many more engineers that have been involved with the James Webb for perhaps 20 years. I've lost track, to be honest. It's via the European Space Agency that I became involved through committees, which I won't bore you with, but by being on committees, I got associated with instruments and now with the science. So now I'm getting the benefit of those 20 years of boring committees. This is one segment of the telescope. There are 18 segments here, hexagons that fold out to make a six and a half metre mirror effectively. And this is just one of them. If uh, people that live in Durham want to go and see this, it's in the foyer of the Ogden Centre West Physics Building. I use it for outreach purposes. It's not an original, but it's the full size. I had it made by a bathroom company, and it was a lot cheaper. So if you want to go and see it, you can see it uh, through the window. Who was James Webb? Normally, when they launch a space telescope or a satellite to study the universe, they name it after a famous scientist. So there is a Newton satellite, there's an Einstein satellite, there's a Kepler satellite, I, I could go on and on. But the people in NASA, not the gentleman concerned, the people that came after him, the administrators said, we're fed up with all these satellites being named after famous astronomers. Let's have one of them named after us. And so they chose James Webb because he was in charge of the Apollo moon program, the landing program. So, okay. Now, there's a controversy, which I can't go into now, but it's a very interesting thing for those of you that want to go into it to look at on social media about whether he was a suitable person. As I say, I can't go into it now. There's, there's different views. There's a lot of literature on it. But nevertheless, this is the name of the telescope, and we continue to use it. For historical reasons, I'm going to mix up JWST, James Webb Space Telescope, with Webb. I'll use these things interchangeably. So you have to forgive me if you get both of these in different slides. So there's a heritage of space telescopes. This is one which I worked uh, on the data from long time ago during my PhD, in fact. I'm that old, 1978. And you can see here a charming lady next to um, a model of this telescope. And it was only 18 inches, or if you prefer, 45 centimeters across. The mirror was that small. So that's the size of an amateur uh, telescope that if any of you are amateur astronomers, you might have an 18 inch telescope in your garden or in your loft or wherever. That's how big it was. But it was fantastic because it was above the atmosphere and it could reach the wavelengths, which we cannot reach from the Earth because the atmosphere absorbs those wavelengths. I have a friend here in the audience who also used this telescope, and we've published many, many papers, and the data is still used because of the archives, even now. So a tiny telescope, 18 inches mirror size across, was fantastically useful. 
So this is part of the heritage. So here we go, the uh, Space Telescope and the Hubble. Of course, this is just an artist's rendition. We can't go into space and take pictures of these two telescopes as they are now. They're both in orbit. The James Webb is a million miles from Earth. The Hubble telescope is a few hundred kilometers going round and round and round in what we call low Earth orbit. I show them together because they're on the same scale. So the mirrors of the James Webb, the 18 mirrors, give an effective diameter of, eight, of six and a half meters. So if you can imagine that, I think every pace is a meter, so it's one, two, three, four, five, six and a half. So the mirror is roughly the screen plus a little bit in the, the shape you can see here. Whereas the Hubble mirror is much smaller. As I said in the slide, it's horses for courses. The Hubble telescope was launched in 1990, so it's really old. But because it was in the low Earth orbit, it was possible for astronauts, some of whom were my friends actually, to go up and fix it. And this is another story for another lecture. But it's exactly what they had to do because unfortunately the mirror was made incorrectly for reasons which are crazy, but it was. However, courageous astronauts were able to go up and to insert little mirrors, a bit like contact lenses, which is what I wear now, into the instruments to correct the optics and everything was more or less perfect. So it was heroic that they fixed it. It works in the visible, that's the visible that our eyes can see, and the ultraviolet, which our eyes can't see and which the atmosphere absorbs. So you see here, this is the spectrum going all the way from the radio through the infrared, the visible, the ultraviolet, and X-rays not shown here. Hubble does a little, little bit of chunk here, the visible and the ultraviolet, and the web does the bit here, which extends slight overlap with Hubble up to the infrared. And that's one of its great strengths, because infrared wavelengths give us a new window on the universe. So this is a representation of the Webb's journey from low Earth orbit from launch to the Lagrangian point. I won't go into details about what that means. It's a useful place to be if you want to be in a cool, and I use that in um, a heat sense rather than a, a young person's sense, but it could be both cool and cool, region of the universe where it's not heated up by the sunlight because it's trying to measure very, very small quantities of heat. And the last thing it wants is to have the sun shining on it to give a huge background. It would be a bit like trying to look at the stars during the daytime if it was uh, closer to Earth. So it's way, way from the Earth. This was its path. During the path, it gradually unwound itself. It deployed its mirrors. And this business underneath are the uh, solar shields to keep the heat away from the um, telescope instruments. Because what you're seeing here is the mirror, but one of the key things is behind the mirror, and that's the instruments. And this is where it is now. So these 18 segments of mirror had to be lined up. And this was a very clever thing to do using lasers to get the perfect images that we now have. Every hexagonal element had to be very carefully maneuvered using tiny pistons that pushed and pulled, called actuators, to make them as if they were one mirror, to simulate one mirror. And these are just a representation of the blobs the lasers saw to make the image as perfect as possible. And it is extremely good. So here are a few big questions which many telescopes are seeking to answer, but the web will also address them. How did the universe begin? That's a good one. How did it get from the beginning to where it is now? What I call the chicken and the egg question, and that is what came first, the first stars or the first black holes, which then caused material 
to form stars and to be pulled in under gravity to form galaxies. We still don't really know what came first. They may have happened together, but one thing probably had to be the first thing. How will it all end? Well, I'll come to that in a minute. It's a very interesting question. And are we alone in the universe? I'll address all these in the next uh, half an hour or a bit more. What is the universe made of? I think many of you have seen this engraving from the Middle Ages, where um, this um, learned gentleman um, is breaking through the, uh, the crystal sphere and looking beyond, and he thinks he sees a clockwork universe presumably the clockwork uh, made by God and set running by God and kept running uh, by God. And everything is, um, is in tune. The planets go round in orbits. Uh, in those days, they thought that the Earth uh, was the center of the universe. So, and they had really no idea what things beyond the crystal sphere were made of. So let's call it stuff, but that's not, not a very technical term. So I need to unpack that slightly. So here is our best guess at the moment, a famous pi diagram shown here. And the, um, the good news is we think we know what the stuff, we can call it what it's called. We don't know what it is, but we know what to call it. On the right-hand side, what we call normal matter is everything in this room, in the earth, in the sun, in the stars that we can see and we call that uh, normal matter. Heavy elements, meaning the periodic table, basically. Subatomic particles, like neutrinos. The stars themselves, made of these things. Hydrogen and helium, which makes up most of the universe. The bad news is, all of this added together comes to about 4.5% of the entire universe. Now, dark matter, which you may have heard of, we have somebody here in the university called Carlos Frank, who spends most of his time trying to get the computer to answer the question of what is dark matter. No luck yet, but it keeps him busy. So 25% uh, roughly of the universe, or actually it's, um, no, sorry, 21%, I should say, is made up of this. We think it's probably a subatomic particle, but we don't know what sort of particle. It's not a Higgs boson but it might be something that we haven't yet discovered. So that's ongoing. Now, the real problem is that 74% shown here in blue is dark energy. And nobody has a clue what that is, except that we think it exists because of the rate of expansion of the universe not acting as it should. We may be completely wrong, because when you have a huge question mark represented by the blue here, it might be telling us that our basic model is wrong, but we haven't yet figured out a better, a better one. Well, most people, when I say people, I mean astronomers, don't think there's a better one than that dark energy exists. It's a sort of negative pressure, but it's totally weird. So now the timeline of the universe. You may have seen this before. We start with um, the Big Bang. Uh, which is time equals zero, let's call it. Then in a tiny fraction of a second, subatomic particles are formed. Now we have this interesting term which we've used for many years called inflation. It doesn't mean um, what we now call of inflation for our, our daily lives. It means the universe expanded very, very rapidly for reasons we don't fully understand in the very early universe. It needed to do that to make the universe look like it does now. And then, past that period, there was a very long period between about 380,000 years, 13.7 billion years, where galaxies formed, evolved, clusters of galaxies formed, and now we have what we see now in our local universe. So, time equals zero the Big Bang, or I have a better description actually, which I've come across quite recently, and that is everything everywhere all at once. Uh, what I mean by that is, where is the center of the universe? You're at the center of the universe, I'm at the center of the universe, everywhere's at the center of the universe. It's like saying, where is the center of a, of a balloon that you're blowing up? Where's the center of the surface of that balloon? 
Well, it started at a point and it got blown up. So there is the, everywhere is the center. So that's, uh, that's why it's quite a, an interesting concept to call it this. I want to talk about time. So I've got about uh, just over half an hour left to talk about time. Here, here we go, time is marching on. So time goes in one direction. And uh, I can just about remember something I was taught as a, a teenager, a somewhat classical education in my grammar school. And it goes something like this. The moving finger writes, and having writ moves on, nor all your piety nor wit can call it back to cancel half a line, nor all your tears wash out a word of it. I quite like that. Uh, it does give the impression that time is a one-directional thing. Let's move on. So types of time machines, um, I won't ask for a show of hands. Uh, most of you will know that this is the, uh, the movie representation of H.G. Wells' time machine from the 1950s movie. No prizes for this one, the DeLorean, and even less prizes for this one. But telescopes are one-way time machines. Looking back in time is looking back in distance. The nearest star is about four and a half light years away, so it's taken four and a half years for light to reach us from Alpha Centauri, shown here. So that means the light that has now come to us left Alpha Centauri BC, before COVID, that way back. Now let's look back 13, 44, uh, 1,344 years. That's back to the year uh, 679, if I've done the calculation correctly, and I think I have. So the light that left the Orion Nebula, which amateur astronomers will have looked at, and even non-amateur astronomers might have seen through a small telescope, light will have left that region of space when the Lindisfarne Gospels were being written. And of course, the people at that time didn't have big telescopes, so they were, probably weren't looking at Orion. Um, it was before the invention of the telescope, anyway. Let's go back even further. Let's go two and a half million years. If somebody asks you how far can you see, you should say uh, two and a half million light years, because you can see the, sorry, here we go, the Andromeda Nebula, uh, which is called M. Messier 31. The moon is shown here to give you an idea of the scale. You won't see it like this in the sky because our eyes don't integrate the light. So what you'll see is a faint fuzzy patch. But you're looking at light that left Andromeda two and a half million years ago when Homo habilis was just getting started. And I'm not sure which one he was, probably was a bit off scale here. But that was a long time ago. Finally, can we look back uh, to the Big Bang? People often ask, uh, after I've given these lectures, especially on cruise ships after people have had a few drinks, they want me to tell them what happened before T equals zero. And I can say to you now in the audience, there's a cathedral nearby, so pop in there tomorrow and ask them, because it's above my pay grade to answer that one. You'll have, to, uh, you'll have to make the best of it. However, can we see back to the beginning of time? Not entirely, but we can listen to the cosmic microwave background. And no expense spared, I have here a shortwave radio. Does that, does that uh, you can hear that? So some some percentage of that hiss is the echo of the Big Bang. I think that's absolutely amazing. Sometimes I like to sit in the dark with a gin and tonic and turn this on and close my eyes and think that I'm listening to the birth, not quite the birth of the universe, but the cosmic microwave background. We'll get back to the web in just a second. <laughs> 
So looking into the future, well, we can't really do that um, in real time, but we can predict. We can make a prediction using supercomputers and making models of what the universe will do in the distant future. Now, of course, our theories might be wrong, but our best guess at the moment, using computers uh, here and elsewhere in the world to produce what we call the cosmic web, Uh, this, is, this isn't a real picture, this is done inside the computer. So what will happen in the long distant future? Well, as far as the Earth is concerned, and it won't bother us, about six billion years from now, our star, the Sun, will become a red giant. And although that's a cooler star than the Sun, it's much, much bigger. And it's eventually, it won't actually absorb in its atmosphere the Earth, but it will get so big that it's going to fry the Earth. And so this is serious global warming, but it's six billion years in the future, so I don't think any politician is going to worry about it. The end of all things. I'll go through this rather quickly because it's a bit um, dense, but when I say 10 star star 12, I mean 10 with 12 zeros after it, whatever that is in billion, 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 you figure it out years from now, stars will stop forming galaxies and the light grows dim, the galaxies fade. Add another whatever number of zeros onto the 10 here and the nucleons that make up atoms decay into radiation. 10 to the 100 years from now, supermassive black holes evaporate by Hawking radiation. Hawking radiation hasn't been definitively detected, but most people think it does exist. Stephen Hawking certainly did. And so that is the, almost the ultimate fate. So every photon then, that's everything left after the um, decay into Hawking radiation, will be in its own island universe, alone in time and space. Time will end. Nothing can happen. And so for the rest of eternity, there's silence. If you want it more poetically, then everything loses its identity and merges together like tears in the rain. How long have we got left? That long. So it's not something to worry about, but astronomers do think about it because they like to have models that work from time equals zero to time equals this big number. Meanwhile, feed the birds. There is a way out of this, it's called the multiverse, which may or may not exist. In a sense, it kicks the can down the road because the multiverses will eventually suffer the same fate. But I'm not going to go any further into that because I want to get back to the James Webb. So let's now consider the competition of ground-based telescopes with the Webb. As I've said before, the mirror here is six and a half meters across compared with two and a half meters for the Hubble. Let's think about primary mirrors. This is, when I talk about mirrors, of course, it's a shorthand for saying a light bucket. How many photons, how much light can a telescope collect? The bigger the light bucket, the better, because you can see fainter things. And so we have an eight meter telescope in Chile. There are a series of them actually, there's four of them together, each one's eight meter. And we somewhat unimaginatively call it the very large telescope. We have another telescope which is being built at the moment consisting of these um, uh, seven elements that will again come together a bit like the James Webb to be effectively a 24 meter telescope. We call this the Giant Magellan Telescope. So a bit more original, no longer large, now giant. Any guesses for what this was gonna be called? This is coming up in the future in Chile in, uh, in about another five to 10 years. I'll give you a hint. It's the extremely large telescope. And I didn't make this up. There was a plan, which is now I think gone away because the money is too much, for a thing called OWL. That's O-W-L. That was overwhelmingly large telescope. 
This is what it looks like for the ELT. These are not the real mirrors. These are just cutouts on the ground to show you how big the thing is going to be. 39 meters across, so it wouldn't fit into this room. There are some average people down here, 400 hexagonals, each one 1.4 uh, meters across. So why do we do astronomy from space at all, given these massive telescopes? The answer is the atmosphere is a bit of a nuisance because it wobbles like a mirage. If ever you've uh, seen a mirage, I think they do exist in this country, but not in the northeast because the temperature never gets high enough, but you may have seen it on holiday. It's a sort of shimmering. That's because the atmosphere is unstably warm and cells on the atmosphere are rising and falling and giving a random motion which is causing things to blur. It's also the reason why stars twinkle. Stars don't twinkle if you go above the atmosphere. It's simply because the atmosphere is unstable. This is very bad news for astronomers because it means we don't get a clear view of the universe. So this is the same view of the moon if you were above the atmosphere taken from a satellite. So you can see how much clearer it's exactly the same region that you have. I only use the moon as an example, of course. We don't, we don't care about the moon because we've been there and done that. But the principle is that the atmosphere is blurring things, whether it's the moon or whether it's galaxies. So the James Webb is excellent because it's above the atmosphere and also it's bigger. So this is the comparison of an image taken by the James Webb of a region of stars compared with the previous best image that we had from a space telescope, which was much smaller. So you see here the advantage of having a bigger mirror because it has a bigger resolution, has a bigger fine detail uh, capability than this previous telescope. The other reason is we want to go into the infrared, as I mentioned before, because the region here is very tiny that we've sampled with, our, um, with the Hubble and with our ground-based. We want to push it into the infrared. Now, we have satellites that do all sorts of things, gamma rays, radio, x-rays. Well, that's another story. But in terms of mirrors and reflecting, this is the region we're interested in. So here we have a comparison of an image taken by the Hubble telescope of um, a region of sky, the same region of sky. Let's concentrate on some structures we can see. There's a line of galaxies here. And there's a line of galaxies here. You can see now exactly the same region. But see how much deeper we're going, how much more detail. Another interesting thing is, look at the spikes on the stars here. Now, this is not real. The spikes are caused by the optics of the telescope. We don't really want them, and we'd probably be able to remove them with some clever image analysis, which we're in the process of doing. But it's quite pretty. So if ever you see an image on a web page and it has these kind of spikes, multiple spikes, it's from the James Webb. And if you see the ones from the Hubble, they have different spikes, different characteristics. But the spikes are not real. So the first galaxies in the universe, the early ones, were actually blue. They were blue because it was early star formation and the stars were very hot. Just imagine a furnace, maybe, actually I did metal work at school because I, was, I initially went to a school where they did metal work and then I transferred. And we had a furnace and it was all good fun. So if you look at <coughs> a furnace, the temperature of the furnace gives you an idea of the temperature. Uh, sorry, the, the color, I meant to say, of the furnace gives you an idea of the temperature. If it's deep red, it's quite cold. If it's yellow, it's hotter. I don't think you've ever seen a blue furnace, but if you saw a blue furnace, it means it's super, super hot. So the young stars in the universe, in the early universe, were blue. However, because of the expansion of the universe, the wavelength got stretched. We call it the red shift. So it started off short wavelength blue, got stretched by the expanding universe, and now they're red. So it's good that we have the James Webb that can work in the infrared because it can see the early galaxies that were once blue. And I just noticed on a web page that the, the media still can't get their heads around this. So I saw just recently 
that they claimed that the most distant galaxies were the oldest. Of course, they're not the oldest, they're in fact the youngest. Uh, but the light from them has taken the longest time to reach us, so don't believe everything you read, unless it's in a reputable journal. In addition to that, again, this is a Webb telescope image. We can use, this is a little bit complicated, but I'll try to explain it. We can use a cosmic magnifying lens, gravity. So if you imagine I've got a galaxy over here, forget about the picture for a moment, a galaxy here, and I'm over here, and in between there's a cluster of galaxies, a big cluster. The light from the galaxy over here is coming through the cluster and coming to me. And bizarrely, but it's true, it's general relativity, Albert Einstein was correct, that the cluster of galaxies can actually magnify the light behind where it is. So the light from the distant, cluster, distant galaxy is magnified by the cluster. And these tadpole-y things, things look, look like, a bit like tadpoles, they're distant galaxies which are not this shape. They've been heavily distorted by the gravitational lens but we can see them because they've been magnified, they're brighter. So we can see further back in time by using this cosmic magnifying glass of a cluster of galaxies between us and the distant galaxy. Very useful. So here are some pictures now, um, in the, I think about 15 minutes or so I've got left. I'm going to talk a bit about um, are we alone in the universe, which is of interest to most people. But before that, show you some pictures from the, the first uh, 18 months. I should emphasize that it isn't really 18 months of real data, because the first three to four months of the James Webb was spent figuring out the optics, making sure the instrument worked, doing tests. So we didn't really get going with proper observations until well into the um, 18 months we've now had. But now we're in routine operation, so we're getting loads and loads of data. So here on the left is a web image of the same galaxy. Here on the right is a Hubble image. So the big difference is that the Hubble is seeing different types of stars, and the web is seeing um, regions that are emitting strong uh, lines from atoms, and also there's lots of gas and dust in this region, so it looks quite different, but it's the same galaxy. It tells us different things. One thing I haven't really emphasized, because in a, a short lecture it's probably not the best thing to do, is that it's not just pretty pictures, even if we analyze those pretty pictures. We also take spectra. So we split the light up into many component wavelengths, and that way we can see what the elements are, the atomic, the molecular. We can see whether they're falling into the galaxy, the material, whether it's being thrown out from the galaxy from the, uh, the shift in wavelength. So spectra are fantastically useful, but they're not that easy to interpret in just a few minutes, which is why I haven't been uh, emphasizing them. The James Webb has two cameras, uh, one that works in the near infrared and one that works in the slightly longer infrared, and it has several spectrometers that do spectra in those regions as well. So uh, here's another one, dramatic cosmic collisions. This is a, a, a galaxy which has had a collision with this object here, and it's a bit like almost uh, ripples in a pond. The galaxy's gone through the center and has caused shock waves to spread out the material into the outer region. It's actually called the cartwheel, which is quite a nice name because it does look a little bit like a cartwheel. Closer to home, uh, this is uh, uh, called the Pillars of Creation. When I say closer, of course, it's all relative, six and a half uh, thousand light years away, but that's relatively close compared with different galaxies. The difference between the Hubble, shown here, and the web is that we're looking through the dust. The reason we see these mysterious fingers, almost fingers, is that this is um, molecular material, dust and gas, which is obscuring the light from the stars. And it's been eroded away by the hot stars. The hot stars have destroyed parts of the dust and given these strange shapes. 
A bit like, I suppose, stalactites and stalagmites, where the water erodes away these into strange shapes. <clears throat> a similar sort of concept. So here with the web, we're looking through the dust and the gas, and we're seeing the stars behind. And that's, that's useful because that gives us more information about how stars are formed. So <clears throat> what have we found out so far? I mean, this is only a, a, this is a brief list. There's many other things. But what we've seen so far, which has given us pause to think, and if there are any students in the audience, uh, I'm sure the numerous future PhD theses here, but I won't be supervising them, but I'm sure uh, somebody would. The earliest galaxies seem to be too big for our computer models. Doesn't seem to have been enough time from the t equals zero to these early galaxies for them to get so big. So our computer models, and of course, we told the computer what to do, so it's our fault, uh, have somehow not got it right. We'll have to adjust the computer models. Also, the first massive black holes seem to be too big to have sucked in material. That's what I mean by growing. The black holes have been sucking in material and getting bigger and more massive in the time available from t equals zero to when we observe them now, they seem to be too big. How did they manage to do this in quite a relatively short time, at least a short time by the standards of black hole growth? And just to show that it's not all galaxies, very recently there seems to have been a very uh, interesting result, which I'm not um, competent to comment on too much, uh, about water found in a comet in the inner solar system. This is unexpected because we always thought that the inner solar system was too warm. This may have implications for how the oceans got formed on Earth, because uh, we thought it was all from asteroids. But it could be that maybe comets played a role as well. Anyway, it's under investigation. And this is only the tip of the iceberg. We're getting new results, some of which fit with our models and some of which don't. So now the last part, last 10 minutes or so, what can it say about are we alone in the universe? Are the aliens already uh, here on Earth? Um, I rather doubt it, although perhaps people in Kansas and elsewhere might think that they are and may think they've been abducted, but uh, I think the evidence is rather weak in that respect. Partly because of the distances involved and many other reasons, but the evidence is not there that were, the aliens have been here already. Would they be friendly? Well, according to the sci-fi movies, mostly not, although of course E.T. was friendly, but probably the unfriendly aliens outweigh the friendly aliens in terms of movies. But we haven't actually uh, been visited. Um, and as a brief aside, of course, we've been broadcasting our radio and our TV for many, many years, so the nearest stars, which may have planets around them, could pick up our radio transmissions, and they know that we're, we're here. They know that we have come some kind of civilization. So they can be watching um, I Love Lucy from the 50s, or Peyton Place. I'm not sure what they'd make of it, but anyway, they could pick that up, but it would take them a very long time to get here, assuming they haven't invented warp drive, which, um, most physicists believe is impossible. Is there life elsewhere in our solar system? So these are the planets we know of. As, as you may know, Pluto was downgraded to a, a minor planet, sadly, so we now have one less planet. Could there be life elsewhere in our solar system? Well, again, a very recent result, I think from last week, is detect, this is a real picture, this is not a simulation. Uh, a plume of, of water vapor from uh, Euceladus, which is a moon of Saturn. So these look like searchlights, but they're not. They're just illuminating plumes of vapor coming from the surface of the moon. Not of Saturn itself, but a moon of Saturn. Why is this interesting for life? It's interesting because beneath the ice, the base of the ocean, there will be water, and that's where we think these plumes have originated from way under the, uh, the ice where there could be a liquid ocean. And this is interesting because we know of these black smokers deep in the Earth's oceans where life can exist and does exist because life doesn't necessarily need light. It needs energy. 
and energy is heat. And so it could well be that a similar thing might exist well beneath the icy moon oceans in these planets. It will be primitive life as far as we know. And the James Webb will not detect the life, but it could detect the environments for life. And then way in the future, I think it's 10 or 15 years, NASA and the European Space Agency plan to send actual satellites to these icy moons and to drill down through the ice to analyze the water and to see if there's any evidence for bacteria or primitive life. It's way in the future. So it's possible, but what about something perhaps slightly more interesting, another Earth? I've been showing you some simulations and artist impressions. This is an actual picture, a real picture of the Earth taken from four billion miles away. The Earth is not a square, but if you've tried on your mobile phone to keep, keep expanding and expanding and expanding, eventually you reach the resolution limit and everything appears to be a pixel. And that's what you're looking at here. The Earth is one pixel. It's called by Carl Sagan, the pale blue dot. So this is what the Earth would look like if you were an alien from that distance. So the question really is, and um, I have one here. <coughs> My pale blue dot. Is there one trying to signal us from far away? We've been trying to detect signals radio signals uh, using radio telescopes, but we haven't detected anything. So if there's a pale blue dot sending signals, we haven't yet detected them. Ah, so I need to explain what you're going to see here, otherwise it won't make much sense. So we now know of 5,000 exoplanets. That's 5,000 planets that are beyond our solar system. And that's only the ones we have found because they were easy to find, not by the James Webb, by a different satellite. And what you're going to see, it's rather pretty. I think the, the music lasts about two minutes, and I, I just think it's worth watching. This is a rendition of the orbits of those planets around other stars beyond the solar system. And they have different sizes, so they have different speeds going around them. In the same way the orbits in the solar system the Earth goes around the Sun in a year. Mars <coughs> takes longer to go around. Venus takes less time. So this is a rendition of those orbits set to music. And I think it's worth uh, just watching that. So although the images are not real images, the speeds are real speeds, slowed down, are speeded up so we can see them. So if you find that mind-boggling, so do I. And we're finding more of these planets all the time. So just to show that NASA does have a sense of humor, they have an Exoplanet Travel Bureau website where they advertise various planets that have been discovered. And uh, they always try to make it interesting. So the one here, I need my, um, <coughs> my laser pointer again. They advertise because it has two suns. This is a boring name, but it says here, visit Kepler 16b, where your shadow always has company because there are two suns. And this one here is what they call a nomad. It's been detected by other means. 
it doesn't have a sun, so it's in perpetual darkness, but we know there's a planet. And it says here, visit this uninteresting named planet uh, where the nightlife never ends. <laughs> sure the students would like to go to that. So finishing off now, the first HST, sorry, JWST image of an exoplanet came in quite recently. This is the star as seen on a photographic uh, uh, image, um, CCD image, and they managed by a very clever technique to separate the planet from the star. The big problem with exoplanets is, like the sun, if you look at the Earth from far away, the sun is just going to completely dominate the light. It's just going to blind you and you won't see the Earth. So what they do is they have a clever little instrument that puts something, a spike, in the way of the star and gets rid of the light of the star so you can see the planet. So an analogy often used is trying to see an exoplanet is like looking for a firefly next to a searchlight. The firefly being the planet, the searchlight being the sun. You have to get rid of the searchlight and then you can see the firefly. And they managed to do that with a clever technique. And this is an image of an exoplanet. The white star here is where they have removed the star, the sun of the, of the solar system. By removing that, they can now see the planet. Now, this is not an Earth-like planet. This is a big Jupiter. So it's very unlikely, unless it has moons, of course, that there's life, advanced life on this planet. But the principle is there, the principle of seeing exoplanets by blocking out the light from the, uh, the host star. That's, that's working. And finally then, I said I wasn't showing spectra, but I now have to show some spectra. If we want to look for the signs of intelligent life, we need to look at the atmospheres of these exoplanets. By the way, I assume you all know that by exo, it means beyond the solar system. So the exoplanets beyond the solar system. So the Earth has all these rather interesting features like ozone, water vapor, CO2 is very common. Venus has CO2, does not have ozone, does not have water vapor. Mars has CO2 and again doesn't have these signatures. So if we could take a spectrum of an exoplanet, not a hot Jupiter, but something like Earth, and if we saw an imbalance in the spectrum, like the ozone, something's going on there, we call it a biosignature. The web has the ability to look for biosignatures by using the host star to shine through the atmosphere of the planet and then detect what they see. Now, it's only very early days, but in the next many years, the, the James Webb should last about 20 years, we'll be getting more and more of these spectra. And who knows, one day we, might, we may find a biosignature. And I predict if we do, there'll be lots of argument about, is it really a biosignature or could something be um, looking like a biosignature? Could it be mimicking a biosignature? That will be the big problem. So we have the first spectrum of an exoplanet called WASP-39b. It's called WASP because that was the name of the instrument that discovered it. It has carbon dioxide in emission, but no other oddities. So it's not going to be another Earth. But we're just getting, we're practicing. We're practicing the technique on the easy ones so that in the future we can try the hard ones and maybe find something really interesting. And just about on time, I'm finishing up now. So over the next 20 years, which is the expected lifetime of the James Webb, we can expect many iconic pictures, not necessarily of the moon, but of planets, of stars, of um, gas clouds, the early universe, such as I had on my wall when I was a student. I had the, uh, the Earth rise on my, my wall. This will keep coming in. 20 years is the expected lifetime. Unlike the Hubble, nobody can go and fix the James Webb. If it breaks, that's tough because it's a million miles away and astronauts aren't going to go a million miles. So whereas the Hubble could be fixed, the James Webb can't be. And eventually it will run out of maneuvering gas to keep it where it's supposed to be. But 20 years is a long time. 20 years we can do a lot of things. And well, the longer it lasts, the better value we get for our $10 billion, which is what it cost. And of course, there will always be the totally unexpected. And 
I have to say, this was not photoshopped. This is just a random piece of the universe that a friend of mine discovered. And of course, if you scatter some pebbles on the ground, they're going to form a pattern, aren't they? So eventually you're going to find a pattern, and this is the pattern that he found. So I was very grateful to him for that. So watch this space, and thank you very much.